those events allows us to separate those species apart. So those are called synapomorphies. Those, those are the kinds of things you'd like to be able to find when you're looking in that drawer those will help you tell that this species is different from this one. It means a, it, it, it's, some, it's a derived character. So let's say only this one has teeth. And that little bar means, uh, teeth. well actually in this case it means the evolution of the plot. So what happened in this case is in this evolutionary sequence, it evolved four times. That's what they're saying. Because it evolved. Now that's not very logical or likely. We're, we're probably not going to accept that. It seems more likely that it would have evolved back if it was in the ancestor. And all four of these have the ability to fly. But if we if we're looking at a at an ancestral trait a plesiomorphic trait, they're not very useful in terms of us defining species. Okay. I'm assuming this is new to all of you, right? Okay. So if you had uh, John Clasic's evolution class, you probably would know. So if you take that, you make it. All right, so why is that important? Well, it allows us to look at traits and, and, and make the relationships that are going to go into that hierarchy that includes those seven you know, names that we have to have for each species. So let's think about a mouse and a sparrow and a bat and use synapomorphies that you can see on those organisms to group them. So, T. This is a character and then which ones have teeth? So the mouse and the bat. Birds don't have teeth. Now they did <laughs> a long time ago. The very first birds did. Because we actually find some fossils with teeth. But, but they lost that. So that is a trait that they lost. So this is a character. No teeth. Fly. Well, sparrows are birds and bats. Fly. Warm-blooded. They're all warm-blooded. Bird. Well, the mouse and the bat. And live offspring. Birds lay eggs. So what we've done is we've taken a whole bunch of characteristics and applied them to the organism. And we can do that. And then we can use that to classify these three species. And what we, how we do that is what's called a cladogram. And these organisms that any organisms that are in a group, let's say you have a bunch of different mice, that's a clade. So uh, it was actually called that by the guy that invented it, Willie Henning. Uh, and and using that to produce phylogenies is called cladistics, and he's the one who invented it. So he uses, he, he said, we're going to use synapomorphies, shared derived characters to group our organisms. If they share a derived characteristic, then they go together. So fur, you know, if you share fur, then you're going to be in a group together. If you don't have fur, you'd be in another group. So what you can do is you can make a cladogram using those traits. You can make a lot of different cladograms depending on how you, you decide to do it. But you got to end up with, with these organisms here. <laughs> so fur is R. I don't know why they did R, but anybody know why they would, why would they do R for fur? Why? Hmm? Or R? I do not know. No, I think teeth, this makes sense. You know, light bearing with an L and F. Why not use F? Or no, I guess they've already used F. That's why I'm sure. Okay. Anyway, so what you do then is you start with your common ancestor, some sort of some sort of mouse bird, okay. And if you go up this way, if you want to put the mouse and the bird together, the way you're going to do that, then I don't want to stay there. It's a 
combatant dying. So, so the L means live bearing. So we, that that whatever that ancestor was, live bearing had to evolve, teeth had to evolve, and fur had to evolve to produce a mouse. And then for the bird, they only had to evolve flight. So four things had to change, right? The four little lines. And then on the right side, we had to go. Uh, live bearing had to evolve because we started with an egg layer. Uh, teeth had to evolve because we started with no teeth. Uh, fur had to evolve we started with no fur. And flight had to evolve. So that requires eight transitions, eight changes to get your groupings. And it means that birds and mice are closely related. Closer related than they are to bats. Okay, so there's a cladogram. Here's another cladogram. We can start with, with this one. And it only requires seven transitions. You start with non-flying organisms, and you, you evolve flight, and you can put both birds and bats there. So it evolves here. You don't have to do anything with birds. Then you go live bearing teeth and fur, and you get a bat. You gotta go live bearing here, teeth and fur, and you get a mouse. So seven. So, here's another one where we start with uh, egg layers. So we get have to have light bearing, we have to have teeth, we have to have fur. I mean, uh, yeah, fur. And then we go flight, and we have a mouse there. Flight evolves twice. So flight evolved twice, once for birds, once for bats. And how many transitions? So what Willie Henning did that was really uh, critical was he, he used what's called the law of parsimony. Simplest is best. Simplest is right, in his way, what he was saying. So which one's right? The bottom. The bottom. So, so in cladistics, the, the, the cladogram you produce with the fewest evolutionary transitions be the ones that should be used. Doesn't that really mean it's right? Because it could have, you know, something could have uh, switched back. But it's in cladistics, it's what we accept, and so we make these cladograms and we go, okay, that means bats and mice are closer related than birds are. If well, okay. More than likely, I will give you some traits, some organisms, and have you create a cladogram on the test. I could do that. I've done it in the past. So you count the changes. Or maybe I'll give you more than one cladogram and ask you which one's correct or something. All right? You ever heard of the law of parsimony before? What's another name for it? Yes. <laughs> you ever heard of Orkham's razor? Oh, yeah. Whatever simplest is right. Same deal. All right, so if we do that with all the extant organisms and the fossil ones and all that kind of stuff, and, and what we can do is we can produce phylogenies that we think is going to reflect the evolution of the, of the organisms from and, and really tell us things about common ancestors. So if we look at this particular figure in your book, 1-5, it shows uh, some of the, the big groups that we, we've been dealing with. So you know, here's birds. And I talked a little bit about the problem with crocodilians, right? I kind of hinted at that already. So birds, birds are over here. Crocodilians are over here. These are lizards and snakes. Okay. So, what um, Willie Henning and Platygrams talk about is that if you're going to group organisms and name them, they have to they have to come up in these you know, with these shared derived traits. So the crocodilians and these are some. 
prehistoric reptiles, things. These, you know, pterosaurs, the flying dinosaurs, ornithischian dinosaurs, or things like uh, uh, the old brontosaurus, saurischian or uh, T. Rex, and birds. So birds actually are closely related to the Tyrannosaurus Rex. Good thing it, they didn't stay that large. Obviously, there'll be a reason why they couldn't be that big. But but they're pretty, you know, in terms of ans uh, common ancestor, it's here. So the most recent common ancestor of crocodiles and birds is right here. Lizards and snakes are over here. They're out of that group. So you can put all of these in a group legally, according to the cladistics. And it would be what's called monophyletic. You have one origin. This guy right here, whatever he looked like, was the ancestor of both birds and dinosaurs and crocodiles. Monophyletic. So we have to have a name for that. And we call them archosaurs. So archosauria is a group that includes birds and Crocodilians does not include lizards and snakes. Now, the ornithologists don't want to have uh, crocodiles in their class when they teach about ornithology. They think birds are special because they have feathers. Well, maybe they are. And that's okay. If you want to elevate birds to a class and call it class ABs, then you have to do what? Everything else at that same level has got to be a class. So there, these guys have to be a class, these guys have to be a class, these. So that means crocodilians have to be a class. Lepidosaurians have to be a class. And we're gonna put turtles over here. Now, we can use Archosauria and Lepidosauria as class, as, as a class. But if we do that, we've got to include crocodiles and birds in the class. There's, there's legally nothing wrong with, with talking about class ABs for birds. It's just that then you've got to be aware that crocodiles are going to be by themselves, which is fine. It means we got a lot more classes than, than we had when we talked about the seven classes of the scan. Okay. So I tend to use Archosauria just to make it simpler. But that, and I don't, sometimes I teach crocodilians at the end of reptiles before I start birds, sometimes I wait and use them in birds. But uh, is, that, is that okay? Point is, you have to, your grouping has to be monophyletic to be legal. So, if you want to try to include lizards and crocodiles in a group and leave the birds out, it's called paraphyletic. It means not all the descendants from a single ancestor are in the group. And that is still done that way in high school biology classes. Maybe, I don't know whether it's taught in your biology one here. Traditional Biologists tend to do that still, you know, without you know, kind of making people aware that that's really not the way it should be. So there really isn't a group reptilian. That's that's what we've gotten rid of. There's no class reptilian. Unless if you want to include birds in the reptilian, you can. Then it's okay. All right. Uh, so these are the current vertebrates that we're going to talk about during the semester. So this is the next figure in your book. Uh, actually, there's some of the outgroups in vertebrates that we 
we think are most closely related to things like hagfish. They're there too. What's really nice about this figure, and, and you need to, to look at it, is these numbers, these changes that took place. Um, it's a huge <laughs> table that gives those. So your book actually puts it in, in the appendix, back and back. Uh, but for example, if we look at this number one, vertebrata, there's a list of things that this ancestor had and derived characteristics that we don't see in the outgroup, or it's kind of a little, little iffy here. We see some of them maybe in hagfish and some we don't. But hagfish uh, probably shouldn't be in the vertebrata. So we, we've kind of taken them out. Lampreys fit okay and everything else. Mathostomata means we have a jaw. So in osteichthys, we're going to be a cartilaginous fish. Sarcopterygia, fleshy fin, rhipidistia. Well, that one I probably won't talk much about because that has to do with fossils. Fossils can be in here too. So that creates some problems with names. So sometimes I'll use Sarcopterygia and sometimes I'll use Actinistia. I'll try to be consistent. But it really is okay. This refers to the extant group. This refers to the fossil ancestor. Okay. And if you lose a trait afterwards, it doesn't matter. So tetrapods mean four limbs. Snakes are in there. Okay. So that's a pretty important uh, figure. I kind of go back and forth looking at it when I start a new route, just to kind of keep yourself oriented. All right, so a lot of that had to do with, uh, with fossils, paleontology. You know, we have some pretty good fossils for some stuff. We don't have very good fossils, as I said, for the very first vertebrates. It's not until bone evolved that we really get very good remains. But it is important to, one of the things I want you to do is to um, look at things relative to evolutionary time. And yours, that's a, I, I don't know where I got that one, but your geologic time scale is on, on your back of the front of the book. And it has history. So there's a few things on here what I'll probably do is have one question out of, out of this for each of the groups or something like that. So in terms of time, um, we, we've got some subdivisions here that we look at. Uh, we start with eras. Those are the biggest periods. So, you know, the Paleozoic is kind of when we get started. Anything before that's, you know, we might have few things. The first vertebrates might have shown up, pre-Cambrian even. But Paleozoic and then the Mesozoic is when the dinosaurs are around and the Cenozoic is where we are now. Um, but I'll more than likely use these, these periods. I'll talk about the Cambrian period for the first vertebrates, Ordovician for the first fish, and the bony and the age of the fish, and Carboniferous when we get the first reptile. So kind of one of the interesting things, when the first things show up, so the first, first reptiles, those would be the kinds of questions I might ask. One of the other things you'll notice, the reason I like to use this figure as opposed to yours, although yours kind of shows it, position of the continents. I'm going to talk a little bit about, about how the continents play a role in where things occur today. Anybody had biogeography yet? So you know a lot about it. Yeah, we started off with these uh, land masses that were kind of separated. They, they merge into Pangaea, and then they break apart. Some of them, uh, there's, there's a breakup, and you know, we have some land bridges. So a lot of what happens now is, is influenced by what happens um, in, the, in the Cenozoic, the last, the last era. 
food and where things are. Things like uh, marsupials is really kind of important to know. You know, marsupials occur where? Australia. We have a marsupial, right? A possum. So how, how in the world did it get here? But there aren't any in, in the old. So how the continents moved around is real important. Uh, I kind of already mentioned this one, right? Uh, parallelism. So, in terms of, of that, uh, if we look at primates, there's there's the, the slow loris, the, the very more primitive looking thing, and, and they just didn't change much. So we still got them around. They're kind of nice to have. The coelacanth is one that's, that's that really looks. The first coelacanth was found in 1938. And I'll show you pictures of it. And when the person found it. It was like seeing something that, well, it was like seeing a dinosaur walk down the street because it was so prehistoric. And Matt and Benjamin was pretty, pretty wild to see. All right, so synapomorphies. So they help us to develop the current relationships, but we'll also have these fossils that show up too. So we may have things that look similar in terms of the mice here, but if we if we know the traits that are shared, then we can create a, a cladogram that's accurate. So I'll I'll uh, break the current understanding of where things are related up into groups. So what the fish I'll do in a group, and then when we get to amphibians, I'll put it up there. Your book does that too. It has a figure at the beginning of each chapter on that subject. So what we're doing fish right now. So this this is the the begin the bit the fish are big. It's going to have a couple of these figures. So this is we're, we're actually jumping ahead. Of So, in terms of the vertebrates, um, I guess for this one, it's group, it's up, it, yeah, it's number three. So, somewhere in the neighborhood of, of 540 million years ago, a vertebrate, a, an organism that had vertebrate characteristics showed up. The, the, dark, the solid lines are where we have fossil records. So we don't have, we have no fossil records of that. We have apparently a, a few for some of the hagfish. Fossil records there. So we, we know that things were around. The reason we don't is because they were soft. The first vertebrates would, would not have been bony. They'd have been soft bodied and didn't preserve. So, uh, the vertebral column evolved after the, the myxenoidea bone. Uh, bone starts to show up at, when, when it becomes thicker on the, on the skin as a protection. It probably didn't start that way. Bone was uh, the, the cells, the osteoblasts that make bone. They were probably more involved in regulating um, calcium and phosphate, which are very important to an organisms' nervous system. You got to get that stuff uh, at the right levels to send, you know, electrical messages around the body. So a lot of this had to do with the fact that these, these organisms were uh, pretty advanced in terms of their brain and moving around and stuff like that. So. The, and it turned out that the way to store calcium and phosphate was in the skin. There was where um, the bone was going to end up. So we call it dermal bone. And it shows, once it gets there, then it can start to create something thicker for protection, and that's when we start to see fossils. We're going to see some, some fish fossils that really show up because of the, the bony skin. You saw the, the lamprey in lab. You know, it, it, it's, uh, you know, 
it's pretty soft. It doesn't have a lot of structure to fossilize. So, uh, and our first records of those were during the Devonian. So a lot of these fish, bony fish, or not bony fish, but they had armor on, and they, they could fossilize. When are they all showing up? Well, it's, it's, it's in the Silurian, but we have lots of them during the Devonian. And so we talk about the Devonian period as kind of the age of the fish. Because there were lots of them. And that's where we get our, our biggest fossil records. These things that are down here, pretty minimal in terms of fossils that we talk about. All right, so let, let me go back to the, the first. For you guys drew one in class and that, that had it that was based on the traits of current vertebrates. Um, another way we can we can kind of get some additional information about what the first vertebrates looked like would be to look at what we know as close relatives today. Things that have some traits but not all the traits. Um, invertebrates that don't, you know, don't have a vertebral column. So uh, the, the nearest relatives of, of vertebrates today are, uh, there's a couple things. Let's see. Oh, here we go. Uh, Amphioxus. Amphioxus is a, is a little thing that kind of looks like what you guys drew the other day. It's called the cephalochordate. It has a little piece of notochord in it, uh, and, and it has a little bit of a, uh, of a hit. We know related to that, to the cephalochordates, is a little organism called the urochordata, which are tunicus. They don't look much like vertebrates. They're, they really look like an echinoderm. They look like uh, some of the Some of the some of the kind of germs that on the bottom of the ocean they are kind of round and filter feet. Mm -hmm. So, but there, but we know that they're related to these. There's also one called the acorn worm. Uh, all of these have a little bit of notochord type structure, so that's how we know they're similar to the, the vertebrae. So we look at these now. We used to include hemochordata as being in the chordata, but we don't anymore, we took it out. So there's really three groups that belong to the phylum chordata. Remember, vertebrates are subphylum. So these two guys are also subphylums. So they give us some insight into what the, what the earlier vertebrates might have been like. So let's look at the invertebrates. The other invertebrates are out there. We have echinoderms, arthropods, annelids, and mollusks. And we can we know a little bit about when their traits, uh, what traits they have. Um, and uh, these these are all called called uh, metazoan organisms. So they have they have some traits, particularly embryonic traits that all of them have. And the most primitive ones are sponges, and then we have anemones, which kind of look like our urochordata, flatworms. And, and traits show up. So uh, nervous system, neurons, those kinds of things show up here. In terms of the flatworms, one of the things that's, that, that's important embryologically is that vertebrates have three layers. All of these things up here have, have three layers uh, of cells when they're uh, growing from an embryo. So that, that three layers is real important. Bilateral symmetry is real important. So that shifts from these guys into the flatworms. The coelom. Coelom is real important in terms of how when the embryo is, is forming, there's a, there's a hole in the mesoderm, a cavity in the mesoderm, and that allows you to put your organs in place and that kind of thing. So all of that is found in all of these guys. So those aren't very helpful for us to separate. What we do see is a shift in um, the way in which the tissue layers work. 
when, when, the, when the embryos form. You, you guys know protostomata and deuterostomata. You've heard. We don't teach embryology anymore, but I sometimes get it by one, by two. All right. So what we're trying, what I'm trying to get at is, is we know that the echinoderms are closer related to the vertebrates than these others are. But what? And a lot of it has to do with these these three tissue layers. Oh, let me uh, see. Can hold off on this for a minute. All right. Before I go into the tissue layer thing, uh, we know we kind of derms are are likely related to. Uh, the vertebrates, and I'll get into that some more. So we had some sort of primitive echinoderm, and if you look in the ocean, you have these things that have these little fingers that stick out that have, have they look like feathers, and they, they filter feet. So uh, there's going to be some reasons why we know that. But th there are uh, some that shift the, the filtering uh, devices internally, and that looks a lot like the tunica. Tunica looks, it, it, it's like an echinoderm that took all the feathery structures and moved them internally, and you got a tunica. Uh, acorn worms got a little longer, but, you know, and they're not so close to the right. But here's a, here's a tunica. All right, how do we go from this weird looking little echinoderm thing, a tunica, into something like an amphioxus or even the primitive vertebrate that was swimming around in the ocean. Well, one of the things about tunicates that's kind of neat to know is that their larva is free swimming. So they're sessile, the adult is. It can't move. It sits there on a rock. That doesn't, you know, you can get crowded if all your babies land right next to you and, and grow right there. So what they do is they have larva that, that have tails and can swim away. So the larva uh, can swim away and find a new spot, and they land, the mouth becomes a sucker kind of thing, and, they, and then they form the adult stage. That looks a little like the amphioxus. You know, it, it's, at least it's got a tail, it's got some gills here for breathing, because uh, it's got to have a little bit of energy to swim got a mouth to bring in water and gills and so on. So how do we get from this guy to our little primitive filter-feeding vertebrate? A guy named Garston in 1928 suggested that a process called pedomorphosis might have occurred. Pedomorphosis is the development of adult stages, adult characteristics, in a juvenile and getting rid of the adult stage. It happens with some salamanders today, uh, and I'll we can talk about uh, these, these tiger salamanders, we'll talk about them in the lab. There's some populations in Mexico, for example, where they never leave the water. They stay as, and become reproductive as juveniles. He suggested that that's what happened here. The adult tunica disappears, and the juvenile tunica uh, tunica becomes reproductive, and it and you lose the sessile stage, and that is how we got our first vertebrate. It's still a filter feeder. It's still kind of just swimming around, kind of poorly on the bottom in the mud, but it's going to have some of the traits that, that we need, and then we'll put some more on. Even the primitive ones, uh, we need to spend a little time talking about um, what structures all the vertebrates have. You kind of did that uh, the other day. And 
so we'll start with the, what were the what are some of the ancestral traits that the tunicates or or the amphioxus might have had, and then what traits evolved at each stage, you know, of this. Now, now these are all around today, but we still talk about the fish being more primitive than the amphibians, and the amphibians being more primitive than the reptiles, and so on. It's not exactly right because you know if they're all around today, they're all advanced, but. But in evolutionary history, the fish did evolve before the amphibians and so on. So, so the next chapter deals with a lot of the uh, anatomy. And we'll start with this little guy, since he's like our ancestral vertebrate uh, might have been. We don't have any records of them, but they might have looked like this. So we can look at what this guy's got. And, and assume that that's kind of what we had before. We have, have gills. This guy's a filter feeder, so water comes in through the gills. Uh, no real eyes or uh, no jaw. Uh, we've, got, we've got muscles that are V-shaped, called myomeres, and they're segmented down the body. Uh, we've got an intestine from the front to the back, and we've got a notochord, uh, no vertebral column, we've got a notochord. We start with something like that, pretty much. It's a good way to uh, start. And then from that, uh, we can create kind of a, a non vertebrate chordate, like you guys might have done uh, the other day. Just kind of generalize everything. So it, it's pretty much the 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 uh, amphioxus. What we know by looking at extant fish, things like lampreys, is that there were some advances in the vertebrae. We know that if we start to put a vertebral column uh, around the notochord. That's going to be kind of key. But there's some other things that happen. We, and a lot of it has to do with this organism having to be a little more active. You know, it's going to swim around on the bottom. So its brain's going to be a little more uh, advanced. It actually has three parts to it. A front part for sensing, a middle part for kind of organizing things, and then a back part for sending messages to the muscles. It's called a tripartite brain. We protect that. We're going to protect that with some bone because it's pretty important. You mess up your brain, you're going to not work. So we start, the bone becomes important. Notochord's there, as I said, to help give us some, some ability to, to swim. We're going to move around and we got to have a little better uh, energy. Metabolism is more important. So we have, we, we, put, we put structures in here to keep the gills open so that we can move water through it easier. We're going to have some sense organs to get around. Good digestive system. Our myomeres become uh, W-shaped, and I'm going to, I'll explain why that's important in terms of swimming in a little bit. And we actually might put a little bit of a fin on the tail to help uh, with swimming. This is the table that goes through all the traits that ancestral vertebrates have that the, the non-vertebrate chordate, like amphioxus, does not have. I'm going to go through these, but you need to be aware th that you need to look at this table and kind of pay attention to the things that have changed. Okay? Uh, but I'm going to pick out the ones that I kind of expect you to know. All right? So it's actually a two-part table. So break it down in terms of the brain, respiration, feeding, heart and circulation, excretion, osmo regulation, support and locomotion. I'm going to kind of give you one, one or two important things out of each of those. Okay? So you might want to look at that before I have some try because that's what I'm going to start. So if you didn't notice, not more material. 
So keep up. Make some notes tonight. Go through your notes. And if you, you know, if you end up having questions when you're doing your notes, you can ask me on Friday.